This is KVR, Kaiju Vision Radio, Episode 43, The Last War. Kaiju and Tokusatsu fans, and welcome to Kaiju Vision Radio, a podcast about the appreciation of Kaiju and Tokusatsu movies and discovering their historical and cultural value. I'm Brian Scherschel. And I'm Daniel DeManna. Welcome back, Daniel. This is going to be big. Yes, it is. In this episode, we'll be covering the 1961 film The Last War, also known as The Great World War. The working title, early title, was World War III, The Day of Tokyo's End. This is one of the best movies this season, in my opinion. It's so special. Find it and watch it, and you will love it. Absolutely true. Given how this show does international issues like no other, you are in for a treat because there's no better of an analysis of this movie than what you are about to hear right now. The related topic for this episode is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. But before we get to that, there is a short description of the film that I will be reading, and we will bring you up to date on all of the facts regarding this film that is uh, relatively obscure. So uh, make sure you get all of the information about that. That way we don't have to do an information dump on you during our discussion. You're listening to KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. The Tamuras are a Japanese working-class family living in Tokyo. Mokichi Tamura is a content and happy limo driver who believes that a war will not occur because it isn't in anyone's actual interest and because he can't stand to lose what he has gained. He is proud of his relative financial success and has Japan in general. His wife is a likewise content but sickly woman who is looking forward to the future. Their eldest daughter, Saiko Tamura, and her boyfriend Takano are positive people who are in love, yet they are worried about what could happen if a war happens in the future. The Tamuras have two cheerful younger children, son Ichiro and daughter Haru. Takano sails with Ahara, whose daughter operates a daycare. Ahara and his daughter have hardships in life, but they are happy. Watkins is an international reporter who has the inside track on the events leading up to the war. As a result, he is not confident of how things will go. The Prime Minister of Japan is a collected and wise man who wants to do all he can to prevent another war that could destroy Japan. The Federation, representing the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the Alliance, representing the Warsaw Pact, are two multinational opposing military alliances. Each side is armed with strategic and tactical nuclear weapons, as well as conventional military armaments. The conflict between the two sides is increasing, and serious repercussions can explode out of minor incidents. The human and the war plots are rather loosely intermixed. Many of the events in the war plot happen at some distance from the Tamara family and others, although they are still affected. Eventually, the energy that has been building in both plots meets at a crisis point. The war is the problem. First, a Federation submarine is captured during Alliance military exercises in the North Atlantic. Then a military plane is shot down in the Mediterranean Sea. Then the Federation nearly starts a nuclear war due to a technical malfunction. Then a war breaks out in Korea and tactical nuclear weapons are used for the first time. After that, an avalanche in the Arctic nearly causes a Federation nuclear weapon to explode, which would have caused another nuclear war. There is a break in the build-up to war when there is a ceasefire declared in Korea. The war is started when a Federation and an Alliance fighter collide, which escalates to an air conflict involving tactical nuclear weapons. The war then escalates to a full-scale nuclear war. The screenplay, written by Takeshi Kimura and Toshio Yasumi, is a moderately complex story revolving around a family and their acquaintances. The most important characters are developed well so that the audience can connect with their humanity. There are a few subplots in the human plot that add to the seriousness of the tragedy that happens to everyone in the end. Budget figures for this film are unavailable, but it is easy to tell that the production value was above average. Director Shue Matsubayashi created a tokusatsu film with a heavy element of drama typical of Yasushiro Osu. 
Special effects were directed by Eiji Tsuburaya, and they look superb. There are special effects scenes throughout the movie, but the most special effects are in the last 10 minutes of the film. The music by Ikuma Dan is masterfully applied, elevating the tension as well as the film's more heartfelt moments. It is filmed in tohoscope and has stereophonic sound. This is a dark film. There is an omnipresent sense of doom from the beginning, as the human plot and the war plot are on a collision course. The film is nearly always serious and has a lot of gravity. Between fantasy and reality, the movie depicts extraordinary events in a realistic setting. This is Toho's first higher-budget disaster film not featuring a kaiju, and though it is the first of its type, it is not very experimental, as there was plenty of nuclear war fiction being written and made into movies at this time. This film is an expansion of style because it set the standard for tokusatsu disaster movies from Japan, including significant dramatic elements in the human plot to drive the gravitas behind the special effects destruction scenes. Toho would make other disaster movies in the same vein as this one in the years after this. This movie breaks away enough from the original Godzilla film because of the lack of kaiju and the focus on realism. The movie was made to attract moviegoers into disasters and special effects. There was likely some overlap with audiences who liked science fiction, kaiju, war, as well as dramas. The film was released in Japan on October 8, 1961. The film was successful, grossing 284,900,000 yen, or about 5.3 million present-day dollars. It was released in the U.S. on January 8, 1967, in a significantly altered form. The film is rated 6.4 on that movie database, with only 162 votes at the time of the release of this episode. Of the films covered in this season of Kaiju Vision Radio, this is the second lowest number of votes besides Half Human from 1955, and just edging out the three treasures. The film is loved by fans of Japanese tokusatsu. The English language version was cut from 110 minutes to 78 minutes. It was given a really bad English language dub, passages of narration were inserted, and some scenes were rearranged to work as flashbacks. The reviews of this version were negative. There are a number of forces at play. There is conflict between people's lives and the threat of the outbreak of war. They are working, forming relationships, and having children, while nuclear annihilation threatens everyone. There is a conflict between the two warring alliances because while neither of them wants a world-ending conflict, they keep getting more prepared for one. Some characters have an internal struggle where they see the events unfolding, but they find it inconceivable that another war could actually happen. The theme of the movie is very simple. Don't let this happen, because it will destroy the world. Avoid war at all costs. The film expresses a strong anti-nuclear sentiment, particularly in the scenes of the Prime Minister spelling out the Japanese position on what the two warring military alliances should do to avoid conflict. That concludes Part 1. You're listening to KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. Part 2 of the podcast is the Opinion and Discussion section. I first encountered this film when Daniel recommended it for this podcast, and I'm so glad he did because this absolutely fits like a glove to this podcast and this show. It just, everything about this show just plugs right into this movie so well. So I didn't see it until quite recently, but it has already become one of my huge favorites. Daniel, I know this is one of your biggest favorites, too. That I absolutely love this. Absolutely. Yeah, it is a fantastic emotional ride of a film. I um I first found it, gosh, probably, I finally got my hands on it probably about five, six years ago. Again, kind of like the last few films we've talked about. It's one of those odd things where it's just not available in the United States. And so you can't go to, you know, to Amazon and get a copy of The Last War. And I certainly wasn't going to have the American cut be my first time seeing this film. I had to see it in its original version. No way. Not ha no, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and I finally I finally tracked it down and watched it. I I was prepared for parts of it, shall we say. I was prepared for the, you know, like I knew it was going to be emotional. I knew it was going to be uh, dramatic. I knew what it was going to be about and how what the focus was going to be, but the the sucker punch I received to my gut when I watched this <laughs> film for the first time to my heart. I was, I, 
I finally, when I finally sat down and put it in, I, I got to the very end and I, I was in tears. It got me. It's not a film I watched often for the simple fact that it's an emotional sucker punch to the gut. And there's only so many times you can subject yourself to something like that in a row. But I, uh, I, every once in a while I'll pull it out and I'll watch it. And I'm every single time it has the exact same effect on me in the exact same places. It's, it's really an affecting film. It's a film that is not not talked about in the United States nearly as much as it should be for its effects, its characters, and its place in Cold War film history, Cold War history in general. It's it's kind of a footnote outside of Japan, and that's that's unfortunate. More people need to talk about this film, and I'm glad that we have the chance to do it here because this is absolutely something that people should go and find. It is a... Uh, Remarkable achievement. One of the greatest, I think, anti-war films ever made. Just a, a desperate plea for world peace that only Japan could have made during that time, I think. So it's it's a great film. Absolutely There's a lot of stuff in the, with the Godzilla movies that we were doing. And it's so funny because how so many of the Godzilla movies are just nailed into whatever year they were made in. Absolutely, And yes. here we have this movie released before just the year before the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yep, <laughs> very true. It, the, the, they got the timing just perfectly. Oh yeah, and, and it, it made me cry too. This, this is a tough one. This is a tough film to sit through. Not yeah, it feels like a Yasujiro Otsu film. <laughs> <laughs> this is that's true. I had I had moments where I was <laughs> I was watching it and I thought this is Ozu ask uh -huh. very Ozu ask. We already got through in part one about the looming sense of omnipresent doom and the, the, the atmosphere, the bleakness, all of that. But the other part is uh, just to start up with this, this is the Cold War. This is when the Cold War got deadly serious, even more so. Oh, yes. It's a world war, but it's, it's strange because there aren't any direct battles between the two sides. And instead there are a series of proxy wars fought far away and you can't see radiation mm -hmm. and yet the weapons are catastrophic and there seems to be nothing you can do about it as an average person. We could all be vaporized tomorrow. So have a great day, everybody. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah you, you don't see it. But you have to believe it. And everyone's affected. And if a war actually happens, no one wins. Exactly. Everybody yeah. loses. Mutual assured destruction. Mad. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. That's the Cold War to a T right there. Yeah. In my opinion, the Cold War never really ended. It's still going on. There was just a break in it for a while. But this is one of the hottest periods of the, of the Cold War, 1961-62. It was quite uh, scary actually for a lot of people it was terrifying for a lot of people and um i mean it's this is you know this is the duck and cover period you know this is this is when kids in you know various countries went to school and you know the teachers were you know try, trying to protect them against potential nuclear strikes i mean this was just a part of everyday life the fear of the atom bomb was part of the culture around the world at the time and that's something that if you weren't there, it doesn't really, it, it can't sink in completely that just how terif terrifying that period was for people around the world. And just teaching the, the aspects of this whole thing to children is just, yeah. ha just having to explain this stuff. And, and then you realize what you're saying when you're explaining it and you, you just, yeah, you're, it's you're just unreal. Yeah. Your mind just goes numb and you're thinking, my God, I'm. This is where we are and in the world. you can't think about it all the time because you, then you just worry yourself to death. Exactly. But yet you still have to resign yourself to the possibility. Yeah. <sighs> that's, that's pure terror. Yeah. One of my political science professors, she studied game theory in nuclear war situations. She thought the Cold War would never end. She thought she'd have that job forever and that the Cold War would be never end. Maybe she was right. But yeah. it, that, that had to have been a job, is to actually think about if this happens, what happens after that? How does the situation evolve? Man, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine put, putting my mind in that place for that long. Like, yeah. I mean, the, this movie runs 
a 10 minutes shy of two hours and my brain was starting to hurt by the end of it. You know what I mean? It's, it was, Mm -hmm. it's just my God, imagine, you know, that being your life and not just it being your, your job, but just being a person that, that lived through that. The, the Tory gate banner for the show. And on the other side of the gate is the Kaiju and it's, is grabbing onto a doomsday clock. And that doomsday clock is quite close to midnight. And I had the illustrator do that on purpose. Oh, yeah. Um, because it's pretty close to midnight right now. But uh, this is part of just the theme of this season and of the show, which is you know, examining all of these tokusatsu films. And Godzilla is directly modeled off, into, off of the atomic bomb. So, I mean, you can't get much doom, you know, doomsday clock makes a whole lot of sense. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Have you seen Things to Come? Yes, I have seen that. This is like the first five minutes of Things to Come (laughs) expanded into an entire movie. That's actually a good way to say that. Like all the newspapers are saying war war is coming, war is coming. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's pretty much nothing they can do about it. Yeah, it's it's that entire that period of of fear and paranoia spread out to an almost two hour movie. Yeah, and Things to Come is a good movie. I mean, it deals with oh, the aftermath. And there are yeah. so many movies that have, that deal with the aftermath of nuclear holocaust situations. And oh yeah, and the, one of the ones that I watched was On the Beach. This also connects to The Day After, which is uh, that movie that scared the crap out of Ronald Reagan when he yes. saw it. <laughs> Millions That's of people saw one. it on television when it debuted. Yes. We even get a one minute overture of the music at the beginning, which I really like. And we get oh, yeah. our main themes for the music from Ikuma Don, who is uh, the first time we've run into this composer on this podcast. Yeah, and yeah. It's about wow, time, is it good? Too. He's, he's also, amazing. I also feel like Mishiro Ushima, if they gave something like that to her right now, she could probably do something really amazing with that, too. Oh, I totally agree. I'm a big fan of Don and Oshima very, very much. Mm. I, uh, Don's music is it's, it's, it's fascinating that this is the first we've, we've gotten to him. It's interesting that he scored this. He's, more, he's well known for his Inagaki scores. Um, I mean, he did the Samurai trilogy and the, the Rickshaw Man. Those are some of his more famous scores. And his score for this film, especially that, that beautiful main theme that's appears in the overture and then is repeated throughout is just powerful music. I love the dissonance. Yes. The, at the, in the very beginning of music and, and when that theme is replayed because it's very appropriate. It is very appropriate. I, uh, I love we, in our, on the three treasures episode, we talked about how we love long movies and uh, I'll add to that, that if I put a movie in and it starts with an overture, I'm always like, Oh goody. You know, I know I'm in for a good time. Like I, some of my favorite movies have overtures at the beginning. And um, I know I know a lot of people today are like, oh, it's an overture and they'll hit skip on there. You know, <laughs> they'll just jump right to the movie. Oh, it's no, a, don't, I, yeah. Don't you dare press that button. Don't do it. Don't do it, man. <laughs> I uh, I mean, to each their own. But I'm I'm certainly not going to, especially when the music is this beautiful. And, and the score in this film, it was a strange score. It was a beautiful score. It was almost Hollywood esque. In a couple of ways, it was very romantic in ways that if Akube San's music, for instance, never really got that romantic, he didn't really like romantic music, but Don's music almost felt Western in some places. And yeah, um, that's the word that I had in my notes. Yes, mm-hmm. is definitely very Western. Um idealistic in like in the scenes of, you know, industry and, you know, the people out at, you know, going to the temple at the very beginning, it's very idealistic and uh, beautiful. And it's, it's those moments when it's in the same scenes as uh, a character or characters doing something, you know, pleasant. Those beginning shots of the footage that that's part of it. It reminded me of the submersion of Japan. Yeah. That begins. Actually, same deal that's there. very similar. So very similar. Yeah, we'll get to that. This uh, same tactic, and and they're both yeah. disaster movies. These are they're essentially disaster, disaster movies. movies, and it's they, it's always a, a tell. I think when you put a movie in, and it starts with happy, idealistic music and scenes of um, happy things happening in the country. You, you know, this movie is going to go downhill fast. <laughs> you know, something's going to happen when it starts that happy. Something's going to go wrong, <laughs> and that's not a bad thing at all. But 
I remember the first time I saw this and I knew how it was going to end. But the first thing I saw was all these happy people. And my first thought was, oh, no, no one's getting through this movie. (laughs) No one's getting out of this alive. But the music was a big part of that. And I especially like the moments when it's paired with Frankie Sakai in his his you know eternal giddiness and his optimism and he's like cleaning his car and he's he's smoking his his cigarette and he's laughing with his friends and it really drives home that optimism in him it it accentuates the mood no matter what the mood is the mood is right there backing it up yeah and don did a don was he was great at that. He did a great job with that in the Samurai trilogy. I mean, he's yes. he's a great composer. He was actually remarkably prolific in the Golden Age. He did a lot of stuff, and uh, but he didn't really do a lot of he didn't do special effects pictures like this Tokusatsu pictures. His only other big connection to the genre is some of uh, stock music that he composed appeared in Sayonara Jupiter. Many, many years oh. later, very briefly, you can Which hear I a little bit saw. of his music. Yes, yes. A wild film, <laughs> a crazy <laughs> film. Um, <laughs> but if you listen, you can hear if a Kube music in there and you can hear um, a little bit of Don's music in there. But that's really the only other big thing. If you're into tokusatsu and you're into this particular composer, this is really one of the only times they cross over. And it's very, very memorable. The festival at the beginning is Shichigo San, which is a 753 day. And it's a celebration for children of all of those three ages. And that's yes. what the Tamura family is taking their children to. And it's, a, it's one of those things where it's a rite, rite of passage. Exactly. Frankie Sakai, who was in Mothra, that's the movie that most people are going to know him from. And yeah. he, he has that the cigarette holder and the pink <laughs> gloves. That's right. And he's driving this 1961 Chevy Impala, which is like a boat. <laughs> and, and he's driving this thing around Japan. And I'm surprised he isn't like running over all this stuff as he's driving. Because this thing's huge. He's really enjoying at least his life. He's content. Yes. He's very content. He doesn't think that enough bad stuff is going to happen. And just like at the beginning of the movie, Tokyo has rebuilt itself. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Let's not have it happen again. There's already a lot of stuff built up, and we're only in like the first couple minutes. And we, but we know his character, and we get to know him. We know that something's going to happen, and that he's not going to know until it's too late. Exactly. He's um. Frankie's gr- I, I'm a big fan of Frankie Sakai, and he was a fascinating character uh, in off screen and on screen. And of course, his his only other big major um, Tokusatsu role that most people will know him from is Mothra. And it's um it's it's interesting because he's so funny in Mothra. He's you know he's he was a comedian you know, and so he, he takes on this role in in this film, and it's it, he has his, you know obviously he's very lighthearted for most of the film, which is why I think he got it. But when he needs to be dramatic and when he needs to be emotional, he pulls it off. He only has a few very emotional moments in the film, especially, you know, right at the end when he has his big scene. But yeah. he's he's fascinating to watch because his and this I mean, a lot of a lot of comedians. I mean, think think about Robin Williams. I mean, he was a great comedian and he was also a fantastic dramatic actor. There are a lot of brilliant comedians that make that crossover because a lot of the emotions are pulled up from the same place, I think. And so when you see this guy who most, you know, fans of Tokusatsu will know for being Bulldog or Snapping Turtle Fukuda, and he, you know, he's this goofy guy and he's always smiling, and he's like that in The Last War to some extent, but there's an underlying drama to his role in this and he's so good in this film. He's so good in this film. He'll just, he breaks he my heart. It. He does. He completely owns it. And he's, his, his performance is heartbreaking because you're literally, he's, he's optimism personified. He is the hope of the people in a fearful time that things might go the right way. Things might not go South. He might live. His family might live. His country, which is just like you said, rebuilt itself is prospering and it will go on to prosper because like like we were saying before, there's only so much time that you can dedicate to thinking about, oh my God, the world could end at any second without just losing your mind. And yeah, you're you know, just going to die of nervousness. You're going to die of nervousness. Exactly. And so he, there might be a bit of denial involved in his, um, 
you yeah. know, his his eternal optimism. But still, you, you got to admire the guy for it. And, you know, there's that that feeling of just, oh, God, I I want him to be right. We know he's not going to be right. We know that he's that it's all going to come crumbling down. But the optimism of the era is is his character. It's perfectly represented. And even though Tamura knows someone very close to the information about what's happening, he still doesn't believe it. He still denies it. And it's like he's living in a different world. And he's slow about his daughter being in a relationship, too, because he goes home and then he's like, oh, why would Takarada's character, Takano, why would he be sending a telegram to her and uh-huh. stuff? And, the, and his wife just kind of looks at him like, Ugh. come on, well, bro. it's like <laughs> this. <laughs> She's actually really good, too. I, the description in part one of, of her is pretty uh, apt. But yeah. Yeah, the, the whole family, it's, it's a nice setting, and you know that the movie is just going to keep piling this on as the movie goes. It's like, oh, gosh, and now this, too. But that's how, that's how this is going to go. Immediately, we get a reference to the U2 incident, mm-hmm. essentially, because, yeah. there is an, because there's an alliance and that is the Warsaw Pact, and then there's the Federation, and that's NATO, and there is a Federation submarine that is captured in the Atlantic during a military exercise that the Alliance is doing in the North Atlantic. And so that's one, you know, problem number one. Oh, yes. And then there are a lot of, uh, there was talk about the incursions of uh, planes, into restricted airspace. And that ties into so many conflicts, but it also ties into the Senkaku Islands uh, in the, and also with the South China Sea uh, with ship with the ships and everything. So uh, this is stuff that we're still dealing with today and all these no-fly zones and all mm-hmm. that. Yeah, it all, looks, it all looks familiar considering how old the film is. Also, the Vietnam War started in the beginning of 1960. So that's what they're referring to as Southeast Asia when they talk. And, and this is a, some of these scenes. It's like a little prime minister story. And this, it's, this is all taking place at the Conte, which is the prime minister's residence. Then they mention the South China Sea. And uh, that's a reference to the fact that China, uh, in 1958, released their Declaration of the Government of the People's Republic of China on China's territorial sea. And that was the first time that the nine dash line was legally defined. And so that's why they're mentioning the South China sea, because that's what we're, that's what's going on right now. When it started was way back in 1958. Next we got Jerry Ito and he plays Watkins and he is a reporter. The the very different circumstances than when he was in Mothra as well. uh, Because uh, Jerry Ito was our uh, villain extraordinaire and uh, oh, yes. he, he was just wonderful there but he's, he's awesome. really great here and, and he's really great in anything he really is he was fantastic yeah his japanese he spoke it phonetically in this just like he did with mothra and uh because jerry ito is actually an american yeah he's he's in, he's always interesting to see on screen he had a very striking look to him he, he looks the part of the reporter he does uh, like really well he does. I, I love seeing him and, and Frankie Sakai interacting just because of how much I loved watching them interact in Mothra and seeing them, you know, have a very different kind of relationship in The Last War is it really speaks volumes just to just how wonderful these actors were, because if you see them together, you don't think about, oh, well, you know, these guys were in Mothra together and I'm pretty sure one of them slapped the other guy across the face at least once <laughs> in yeah. that film. But you don't, you don't think about it because they've, they've got you. Their characters have you sold. And that's, that's a, the mark of a brilliant performance to me. And, you know, neither one of these, you know, films, th- their scenes together reminds me of the other because they're, v- they're that good. And uh, Jerry's awesome in this. It's always cool hearing him, jump back and forth between multiple languages. Yes. And his voice is amazing. He has a great voice. voice. He he actually, he was a singer in real life. He was a singer for a while, an entertainer. He actually recorded um, most of the way right up until he passed away. But he was, he had a fantastic, very deep, commanding, cool voice to him. So it's always, it's always cool. Whenever he talks, I'm always, I always listen. He's got a great voice. 
And they talk about how, how there's essentially no trust between the two sides of this war and no one wants a war, but there's no trust. And that's a major problem. Oh, yes. And the Soviets, for a long time, they genuinely thought that America was going to nuke them one day. Oh, yeah. Like this oh, this yeah. went all the way through to the 1980s. It was like, we, no, mm-hmm. we thought you were going to nuke us. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's crazy. Meanwhile, uh, Tamura, Frankie Sakai's character, he sees all of his stocks going up, and he's buying these defense stocks, and he's essentially profiting off of the war. And yeah, sort of. That was an interesting. It's, all, it's almost like the ending is is a little bit of payback for the, the way he had been living, and he even admits himself later that he was too concentrated on getting money. Mm-hmm. But he's paying attention to money. But the war is looming, and. The thing is, money won't matter if a war happens, and neither will stocks. Tokyo and Japan have just finished rebuilding, and everybody has better lives, so why ruin that? You know, that's part of what puts him in denial, is I can't believe that would happen. You know, yeah, it's, it's you don't inconceiv- have it in your head. inconceivable to his, to his mind. And it's that's the other interesting thing about his character, because it's his denial slash optimism is at once focused on the world around him, but it's also very focused on himself. And he can't believe that the world would come to an end because Tokyo just rebuilt, and he can't believe the world would come to an end because he's finally getting success for his family, and he's making money, and, you know, he he's he has grandchildren potentially on the way, you know, as, as the film progresses. And so it, he wants to believe the world won't end because the world can't add that just won't happen but it's also kind of a defensive thing because he's thinking man it can't end because then my life will be ruined and my family's life will be ruined so it it kind of bounces back and forth between those and it starts to get more centered and it's it's not selfish but it's more centered around his loved ones and his success and not so much the world around him as the film progresses and that's another thing you can see in his performance and it really symbolizes how a lot of people are. Yeah. They're focused on their lives. They're busy. Yeah. Don't have a nuclear war. We're busy. But Yeah, ex- exactly. I've got a vacation <laughs> the, planned. And speaking of that, the, the man, the old man. Yeah. Yeah. He's donating 10% of everything to anti-nuclear causes. And he was from uh, Hiroshima. And Tamura says, oh, the old man's a show off. Mm-hmm. And his daughter, Psychos, is like, how can you possibly say that? And she says there's so many intelligent people, but they're not going to be the ones who have the power when all this goes down. Yeah. And cooler I like, heads yeah. may not prevail. I loved that line, too, about how, you know, the, the world won't end. There are too many smart people in this world to let that happen. Well, uh-huh. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's, I, I thought that was an interesting, an interesting viewpoint, because I wonder how many people still today think that that's honestly true. You yeah. know, who, who who knows at this point, but it's... It's the now that's just that's just that's denial right there. That's that's Absolutely. basically writing it off. The old the old the thing with the old man was definitely fascinating too because today if you were to put something like that into a film, it just it would it would come across as just very very heavy handed in your face and it's 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 heavy handed in in the last war but it wasn't made to be like that. I mean, it was, you got to think about the perspective from the, you know, the people who made the film, the era it was made. We're talking about a country that got nuked twice, but the, the last war and other films of this era that are, are like that. I don't, I don't see them as heavy handed, you know, in a negative way. I see it as like this film and other films like it, especially Godzilla, the original Godzilla, uh, to which I draw many parallels, uh, between that film and, the last war it's a cry for help it's a plea for peace and you can't get too heavy-handed when you're talking about the end of the world and you just want to shake the camera and yell into it please don't blow up my planet so Mm -hmm. the the if like today if somebody were to put the you know a a line like that in about the old man and his 10 percent and stuff like that you'd probably get people in the theater rolling their eyes no matter how good the message is but in this film in this context in this era it's a sobering moment because you think, my God, this guy lived through Hiroshima and he's, you know, he's, he goes around at night selling food and that's how he lives. And he's giving his money to stop what happened to his hometown from happening again. It's a, it's a subtly powerful moment. 
it's not in your face, but it's very like it, it. I was a I was very affected by that. The more I thought of it, you know, after I saw it the first time. Yeah, and it's if you're especially if you're Japanese, it's gonna hit home even oh, more. Yes, yes, yes. If it's and again that era, 1961. You know, it's not that far removed from World War Two. No. And so next, an incursion happens, and uh, in the Mediterranean, a plane goes into enemy territory and is shot down. And this could easily happen in any number of dangerous areas around the world. And they're looking at the televisions, and that's when the news comes across, and they're immediately engaged by it. And at one point in that scene, uh, Tamura, he says, who needs a second television? That is just <laughs> funny. That's good. I mean, it, especially keeps, yeah. now, I think the further time goes that people have so many devices now that yeah it's not it's, even <laughs> it, out of context it's like man that's second tv that sounds great but in in the 1950s and sick in early 60s it was extravagant. Like, right yeah it, having eight there were very few people that had televisions in japan like in yeah the, 64 was yeah. the big year that a bunch of people yes. in japan got televisions that yeah. was the big year and i don't know if if the numbers were any different from say like the mid fifties in 1960 or 1961, but it was all gradual increase throughout. It definitely started to get more and more and more like in, in 1954, yeah. the, when, if, when you see in the original Godzilla, that the Yamane family had a television, they were very lucky in that film to have a television. And that's a, a yeah, cultural that's a deal thing back kind of yeah. miss. But if mm-hmm. you don't know the history of what's going on, but by 1961, it was starting to get a little bit bigger. But like, you know, second television was like way, you know, it reminded, reminds me of Back to the Future. No one has two television sets. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't happen. But yeah, and it also reminds me of Good Morning, where yeah, they get the television yeah. and the kids want the television. Really bad. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, right. And they're talking about buying washing machines and the woman next door is like covetous and jealous of it. <laughs> that's right. So the, the this incursion with this plane is interesting because something did happen in 1983 that Korean Air Flight 007. That's right. Uh, that, yeah, that was that was discussed in the the uh, Return of Godzilla episode on this show uh, because that was one of a pretty big deal because it was a commercial plane and it went into Soviet territory because the the GPS uh, system coordinates were off. And then they didn't respond to hailing, and they got shot down. And so Japan and the prime minister, they, they decide that because they're a member of the Federation, they can't really be neutral, so they have to prepare for war, stop it at all costs. And this is all about how Japan's in the middle of all this. And even though they're part of the Federation, they still want to try to act as a mediator with this. The point with the school, this, uh, the daycare yeah, the daycare. That, that's like piling it on now. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, oh yeah. geez, you, daycare? Oh, man. If you weren't depressed before, we're going to throw kids into the mix, and uh, that's that's about as sad as it gets right there. And the man uh, whose daughter is at the school, he is uh, someone who sailed with Takarada's character, Takano. Yes. And so that's what the connection here is. And he is played by Chishu Ryu who is a huge veteran of Otsu movies. Yeah. Uh, yes, he Otsu is. movies. And he fits into this movie really, really well. Uh, he's, and he, he's what he's grateful that he's alive. That's his personality. Exactly. That and having an ulcer. Yes. <laughs> and the, the, his, and his point in that scene was about how children can teach us a lot. And he's very right because about that. Be, Absolutely. Yeah, because they're not as jaded. They're not as educated in what's been going on and as opposed to older people. And the children are more willing to give peace a chance. Exactly. They are the ultimate innocence. You know, that it you know, a child isn't gonna push the, the button to launch a nuclear warhead. Then, twenty six minutes in, we get one of the biggest surprises that I saw in this movie. And it is that part where we're at the Federation base yes. and then they get that camera and they take it in behind this guy as he's going in. Yeah. And that is, this is downright Hitchcockian. That was a, very, that's a good point. 
<laughs> the, the camera, it tracks around the room and it's moving and it, it looks like it's being lifted or being yes. moved by something, but it's, it's kind of, it's, all, it's got a little bit of that wobbly, like handheld feeling going on too, though. Yeah. They established the heck out of that control room. It's they impressive. Really did. I, I really love long takes as you might be able to tell with these scenic videos on YouTube, but <laughs> yeah, that's it, right. It's a, th- this is a pretty big and cumbersome camera to move around. It was, it's possible. It was on a crane that they, they wheeled in yeah. and then they just kind of lifted it and, and tilted it, it goes which, up the stairs. But yeah, cause mm-hmm. it, that probably explains the wobbling too, Yeah. but my, my God, that entire, that moment where the two, the two get smart doors open and in, and in he walks and it's uh, very my, sinister. Yeah, it did. It felt very almost Bond like, but without the uh, the the colorful fun of the whole thing. It felt very. It didn't feel like oh, this is a fun Bond villain. It felt like we're walking into something dark here. Yeah, like, no Shark is, Tank. Y- yeah, <laughs> very much <laughs> but, so. Yeah, yeah scary, scarier than no pr- no piranhas. Than a lot of, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then a plane shows up at sixty thousand feet. It was a spy plane, and then that's kind of going back to the U-2 incident again. Oh, yeah. And so they have to hide the missiles. Uh, and then they have, we have that wonderful, nice uh, mural, the aerial view of the Federation base. Yeah. And it has a plane yeah. uh, flying over. I like that. That um, was a really cool then, effect. Then we see this Alliance mainland missile base. Lots of nice mural, nice model. And uh, and they were able to find the missiles that the Federation had, so they the spy plane was successful. Let me go back to our family plot, and we have Psycho and Takano, and they're being funny because Takano is imitating her dad. Then he walks in on them, and then they get into the conversation about marriage, and about love, and if if. Uh, Tamura and his wife, if they were in love before they were married. Yeah. And, and then Tamura says, well, you can't help it if you're in love. And uh, then they're asked who fell in love first. And so it's a nice conversation. And it's it a really doesn't, nice moment. It doesn't really seem all that, like it's, it's pretty well written. And the, and the point has gotten across is it's a rather Western take on, on marriage as well. And it was, they end yes. up being happy in the end, of course, because you have to keep building up the happiness in order to pull the rug out from under us later. <laughs> that's but right. The, it's a it's a good scene. I really like the chemistry that's going on. It's quite natural uh, the, the way that they interact. Yeah, that's one of my favorite scenes of the entire film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the music just carries right along with it, just doing a great job. Oh yeah, uh, in, in a lot of these scenes that are that involve. Um, to, that involved Takano and uh, Saiko. Then Jerry Ito's character Watkins comes back and has a very partially English conversation yes. with uh, Takano. It's so nice hearing Jerry Ito speak English. He's just got that. He, he his, yeah. He's got like the NPR voice going on. He does so well. <laughs> he could have been. He could have been like a radio announcer. Man, he was great. And he yeah. did. He did act a lot with his voice, and he used his voice in other other things as well but like he's like you could tell listening to him and no matter what language he's doing and uh ishiro honda once once said of his english that it was uh of his japanese rather that it was like really really bad japanese <laughs> but um his it doesn't really matter because his voice just sells it and uh, you get to hear akira takarada speak english too which is always yeah. cool that doesn't happen a lot um latitude zero that he he speaks the entire film in english but uh it's it's really cool, and he's he does a really good job with it as well because he didn't he didn't know a lot of English when they shot this, but he like he was really really good. Yeah, and it, and because of that, it comes off as a really natural scene with yes. the way that he's talking. It, like it it just fits very well. Yeah. So all this stuff happens on the thirty eighth parallel, and the UN General Assembly is deadlocked, and Japan keeps trying to get. Uh, peace and trying to negotiate all the way to the all the way through to the bitter end as it ends up and there's this uh, sort of little subplot about the prime minister and his kidneys and needing surgery mm-hmm. and Japan is sort of acting like the adult in the room when it comes to these this kind of conflict they really are that's a good way to say it an american 
in Japan that they're talking when they're when they're uh, dusting the cars and they they went back. The Americans went actually back to America. They sort of repatriated, and and that course sort of goes in parallel with how things go before wars occur, where you have people going back to their home country. It's kind of ominous uh, the way that that is portrayed. And Tamura says, well, no one benefits if the world explodes. Yeah. In a sane person's world, that's how it goes. Yeah. But, and, and then the part about how only people with money can relax at a time like this. And Tamura doesn't believe that. No, no, he's not on board with that. And then I have our very wonderful scene with Takano and Saigo in downtown Tokyo. Oh, I love that scene. Yeah, the camera's tracking along with them as they're walking around. And there's no tokusatsu special effects in this at all. It's just a very nice scene. And they're optimistic about their marriage. They're planning stuff. And obviously, everybody, you know, what's going to happen then they move the convo to the omnipresent talk of war in the near future. And, and she's, she tells Takano if it would only take four hydrogen bombs to destroy Japan. In my opinion, it would just take two, but four, yeah. sure. And then Takano has a very nice sort of soliloquy. And he says the next bombing wouldn't be from a plane. It would be from a super supersonic missile, 10 times the speed of sound coming at you. No way to stop it. The whole world's a tinderbox, and it can be started by one small incident. And he said Mongolians were the first users of gunpowder, and Japan was first to have gunpowder used against it. And then the nukes, too, was the first. They were the first for that. And then also the 1954 Bikini Atoll test is mentioned. Yes. And then he, he really Absolutely. tells it like it is here. And he says that we can't allow the younger generation to open the door to destruction. This is just a very powerful moment in the movie. And he says, if one man panics and pushes the wrong button, then we're all essentially screwed. Yeah, and it's the end. We're yeah, sufficiently scared now, audience, in the theater. Mm-hmm. I think so. <laughs> this movie is sort of like Tweak from South Park. <laughs> just screams and... Re- reacts like we're all gonna die we are all gonna die as he drinks more coffee yeah exactly uh, that that moment in particular is really like what a switcheroo it starts out so romantic and then it ends with discussions about how, you know how, just how the world is going to end and takarada takarada is magnificent in this film this is actually one of my favorite favorite roles that he did because again, probably, no, just, probably not very many people mention that to him. No, I, um, like, when yeah, I, when I got, yeah, when I got the chance, I've actually, uh, had the, the fortune to meet Takarada san several times in person. And, um, I don't remember which meeting I did. Uh, I made sure to mention the last war just cause I thought it would, it would mean more to him to, to hear about this film because he, you can watching this film, you can tell he put, so much and like everyone in this film put so much into their roles but takarada um definitely does as well he's and again he's emotional when he needs to be he's dramatic when he when he needs to be he's romantic when he needs to be and he he completely sells it and he if you listen to him talk about like in interviews more recent interviews takarada san talk about uh godzilla and you know, like how, how he, how, what the character and what the message of the character means to him. There are echoes of his speech from this scene in the last war in his interviews where he talks about, you know, a a call for, for world peace and for disarmament. And if one person makes a mistake, we're all in trouble and how we can't let future generations grow lax in the face of potential worldwide destruction. I can, I can almost, I almost feel like he didn't need a script for that moment because that's something that the actor in question general genuinely felt. And I think most people felt that at the time watching him, but there was, it came from a very genuine place. He's representing a large part of what the Japanese people also think. Yes. He's, he's he's, distilling, he's channeling that sentiment. Yeah. Very much so. And that makes the scene even more powerful and uh, like d- he directly mentions, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Bikini Island uh, um, tests, which is, you know, when you consider that just a few 
what was it, seven years earlier, those things had to be disguised in a metaphor form in the giant monster film. And now we're just throwing right. it out there. That's a fascinating evolution as well. But yeah, that's a, that's a great scene. And then of course he talks about anything could happen. An accident could happen and we could all be wiped off the map. And then what happens next? Yeah. We immediately cut to missiles. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Harold Conway and he's from battle in outer space and Gorath. And he was in the Mysterians with the, the with the mustache, and he's right. like the Federation of kind of a ge- general, I guess. General, yeah, yeah, of that facility, essentially. Yeah, I'm not. I'm and not he sure ruminates what his rank about was. the yeah, and he ruminates about the button and the red light versus the green light, and he thinks, well, is coexistence possible? What do you think? And then mm-hmm. that that one guy from Mothra, the end, yeah, towards the yeah. end of Mothra, he's there, <laughs> and then um, also uh, Robert Dunham is in this. Yes. He's uh, in, in a small part, as is uh, Nakajima. Mm-hmm. He uh, Hiro Nakajima is a, a policeman uh, in uh, one of the uh, very crowded scenes of Pandemonium towards the That's end. Right. So then they're talking, and then all of a sudden we get this scary red firing order display, and then it has all these positions that are signed off on it. Everything lights up like a Christmas tree, so I guess we're all going to be dead now. That's and right. He rings the bell and he gives the 60 second countdown and says, God, forgive me. And then it's all very dramatic. And then they get the call from people higher up and they're like, stop this. The equipment's out of order. Nobody said do anything, which generally, if you if that lights up like a Christmas tree, don't you want to confirm? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, never mind. Yeah. So then <laughs> then we got 15 seconds left. Then everything stops with three seconds left. Everything's fixed. It. it sort of reminded me like when Leslie Nielsen tripped over the cord to the bomb and then it stopped running. That's <laughs> that's right. But it's similar. I, I, I read a review uh, that was on the Internet about this movie, which is there's not very much about this movie on the Internet. No, there's actually. not. The, the review had issues with the uh, the English speaking actors in, mm-hmm. in this movie and their sort of acting ability, I guess. And. I I really don't even notice it. It just is what it is. I, I've been it, yeah. watching all these movies for so long that have English speaking actors in them. It's I understand that you're not going to be able to get James Stewart. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, for these it's not parts. Like, yeah, it's not like they were going to get Brando and ship him over to <laughs> ship him over to, Japan. For, to do like what a paragraph. I can't imagine they got Jimmy Stewart for something like this. Well, I'm I don't want to press that button. <laughs> That would that would be cool though, but uh, it's they had to they had to work with with what they had and who they had. And remember, this is 1961. Most general movie going audience members in in Japan didn't speak English, and therefore they they heard the English. The subtitles are burned into the print so they could understand what was happening. Getting somebody to deliver a you know Jimmy Stewart level performance was not necessary to make the film work for a Japanese speaking audience. It's, um, it's, it, need, that's a tradition that keeps going all the way. Yeah. You don't yeah, need you, that. You don't need, it. you don't need that. No. And that's a good point. And then wh- what do we have in 2016 in Shin Godzilla? We have Kyoko Patterson and uh-huh. that's kind of the same thing. So then on the 38th parallel in Korea, the Korean peninsula is still quite a very real place for the possibility of world war three breaking out. There are these radio-controlled tanks present, and we get the special effects, the explosions, planes shooting the tanks from the air. Then we get the unexpected fact that there were tactical nuclear weapons that were used for the first time. That's right. We see the the human bodies that are burned uh, into yeah. ashes and that's, ashes blowing away, totally terminated through, through terminated through Judgment Day going on yeah. here. <laughs> they reminded me of that too, for sure. I was a oh yeah. my gosh, first time I saw that because that didn't. I don't I I don't know off the top of my head if there's another Subaraya specific project where that was attempted, something like that, showing burned ashen human remains from the you know the aftermath of a nuclear explosion. Um, if if there is, I haven't seen it, but like the the my God, it was a haunting moment. It reminded me of the images that are taken of like the bodies at Pompeii, burned in ash yeah. and preserved, and the way they were blowing in the wind. It was just like, oh my gosh, could you imagine having you know being on the set and being tasked with creating the effect of a 
Pretty radi- grim. irradiated, burnt human corpse blowing away in the wind. Like, I don't know. Like, that must have been an emotional day on the the special effects set. Yeah. The, the, regarding all these tactical nukes, essentially a tactical nuclear weapon is it can be any conventional weapon and then you add a, a nuclear based explosive to it that's basically yes. all it is there because we have strategic nuclear weapons which are the big ones that you take out whole cities with from a very long distance away and and the strategic nuclear weapons are used where there aren't very many friendly people around that's right and then the tactical nukes are smaller and they're used in order when you do have people that you don't want to kill that are on your side that are close to the action. So that's the differentiation between these two kinds of weapons. But the real problem with tactical nuclear weapons is, is that once you use those, then you can start a nuclear war very, very easily. That's the, that's the first crack in the can of worms. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, once that yeah. escalates to that, then it's easy to escalate up to the next step. And that's yes. what is uh, so risky about all this. Then we go back to the Conte, but a war still hasn't even been declared yet. If the, And also, if this actually happened, if somebody used tactical nuclear weapons, that would be, a, it would cause like a large scale panic. That, oh yeah, people Probably would. Probably globally. Yeah. People would freak out. And then there's the whole thing with rumor control. I mean, back then, rumor control was pretty easy. And in this day and age, good luck with that. And then they they even say how rumor control could create more rumors, as can happen. But nowadays, it would be so much easier to... Oh, to I mean, the, the interconnectivity of our our culture right now basically means that if something like that were to happen, everyone on Earth would have it buzzing in their pockets on their phones in seconds yeah. like somebody would see it from space somebody would see it from their backyard it doesn't matter somebody would know and the news would spread and it's it's hard to keep secrets like that anymore i mean back in 1961 that interconnectivity was like beyond not feasible it wasn't even dreamed of at that point you know it was there's no you no. know, there was no precedent for that kind of that kind of connectivity in the fact that you could talk to anyone on the planet and get any knowledge you wanted with the touch of a button in your in your pocket. I mean, Star Trek hadn't even done that yet in 1961. That just didn't happen. Even like not a lot of sci-fi even went there. And the PM, he goes, Prime Minister, he goes on a terror about how Japan has now come to have influence while having no military technically, although the SDF has been around for seven years. But mm-hmm. Japan has learned how to do without a military. That's sort of the point that he's making. And we have to teach the rest of the world that. Well, it's a little bit of a dated analysis that definitely was part of that generation, though. Oh, yes. J- Japan isn't like this as much now because of all the cruise missiles that are currently aimed at them, mm-hmm. as well as the U.S. bases and the Japanese bases. There, there is the, it is, it's kind of a loophole. Because, yes, Japan does have a military, but it's just that it's ours. It's not theirs, but they are paying for it. But it's it's still their country. So I, I totally understand what the prime minister is saying in this. Yeah. It's just that it's a little bit of a technicality when it comes down to it. Obviously, Japan had to side with one of the two sides because it was um, on the brink at the end of the war anyway. They were forced to. But... It's important, though, because this is how Japan views itself. The one thing that they didn't engage in was nuclear weapons. And that's what really set them apart in this. And that's one thing that they were, why they were able to declare, we want to be able to mediate this that's kind right. of conflict as opposed to just going with whatever. That's right. Then we get our wonderful moment when... We get chapter four from the book of James in the New Testament going on. That's right. She Because it's the old man, and she goes to the old man, and then he, what does he do? He puts that little donation into the box, which is the, the part that he's donating away of what the money that she gives him. She opens up the Bible there, and then we see our models, the Tower Bridge, in London and the tower of London and New York city and Paris and Moscow, specifically the Kremlin. That's right. And and the whole thing is from where come wars and hating among you come. They not hear even your lust that war in your members. 
You lust and don't have, so you kill. You desire to have and cannot obtain, so you hate and quarrel. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motive that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers, do you not know that friendship with that world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever will be a friend of that world will be the enemy of God. This is a very searing indictment of the world powers. And they actually showed every nation uh, on the Security Council except one. Interesting. China. In Ch- mm, okay. Wow. Yeah, because there's, there's no Beijing. Yeah, yeah. That's Probably, interesting. I don't know if they wanted to do that. I'm pretty sure there, somebody made the decision to not do that. But it Makes sense. So then we go back to our school, and the kids are singing the New Year's song for the man at the school when he's leaving. We, we've reached critical mass now. We have the children. We have the, we've already had the Tamuras in the garden with the tulips. We had that lined up. Oh, and so yeah. now we're really, uh, really at uh, critical mass here of all of the great things that are going to go down. And we return to uh, Tokusatsu Land and our snowy model of the Alliance North Pole Missile Base. Now, this is the Warsaw Pact one. So they've armed this missile, and then the avalanche causes damage. And the avalanche looks great. Very the nice was really special good. effects. And the snow flying through the air, all the explosions, the cracks appearing in the wall. It looks great. But it, and then the missile starts counting down. And that's really bad. And the Alliance general says, I'll go up and fix it. And he actually does. And that's the, that's the other close call. So both sides have had a close call on this. That's and a, they build up the tension really well with all the constructivist film editing and the quick cuts and the music is just great while not being overpowering. Yeah. And so now we've had both sides that could reach a nuclear war and both generals, no matter which side, both generals were like, Oh, thank goodness. Thank God. Because, and they, they knew how bad it, it would be if that happened. Um, then at the ceasefire, there's a ceasefire on the 38th parallel and we get our nice little breath of peace right before things go completely down yeah. the toilet. Then at Federation HQ, two planes collided and everybody starts shooting. Now the yeah, it the just, air it battle just goes is to hell at that point. Great, the air battle looks great though. The chemtrails that are coming out of the planes. Yeah, I noticed that's that. Sweet. Yeah. That is like how hard like they they like these planes are tiny. You know, when you watch the film, you f- completely forget that like the, these planes are. They're not real planes. The way that they're shot in this film in particular, it's some of Subaraya's best aerial uh, effects work I think he ever did. It might be. In any of his yeah. films. I mean, they had they had chemtrails coming off of them that were sustained for a long period behind the models mm-hmm. of the planes. Like, that is, that's unbelievable. That's incredible. And it makes it feel like it's really yeah, happening. It really does. And it's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible effect sequence. And then, of course, it's, Combined with the images of the, ta- the tactical nukes going off and the uh, the effects for the tactical nukes are interesting, too. It's basically like the entire like film just catches fire in the center and then just explodes out towards you. Yeah. And, it's kind of like it's, uh, it's, it's pretty. Like nu- it is. It's like it's like nuclear bonanza. <laughs> and of like- course, uh, Teriyoshi Nakano also worked on this film. Yes, he did. And you can feel so the I imagine explosive- this might have been his favorite part. I, th- I think so. He's he's still famous to this day for his um, explosions, his bombastic explosions. Yeah, yeah. He um, and I mean he'd done a, he'd done he's done so many memorable booms, and uh, the way that the his fires are colored, and the way that they're filmed, and the way that y- you you look at them and you think, my God, like there was a person on set during this. And, like this is an interesting example because there are no guys in monster suits in any of these scenes, of course, not in this film, but the fact that they still staged these massive booms and these things exploding in uh, the airplanes, these in the airplane models actually looked fairly large. I'm not sure how big they were, but they looked fairly large. They were very detailed and they moved really, really well. And again, to get those sustained vapor trails, they would have probably needed to be larger than, I'm not, I'm not sure, but they were very... They were very cool to look at, and my gosh, the the explosions were great, and the the way that it interacted with the environment was great. And I mean, you can tell there's a the hand of somebody who loves to fly in there with Superaya, and you can tell that you can see the hand of a guy who loves to blow things up, and that's a good combination. 
or in Japan, they, they tell the world community, use conventional weapons if you're going to use anything. And yeah, that's please don't really use nukes. close to what's been going on lately with chemical weapons being used in uh, uh-huh. Syria. That's um, right. And that's what that's been the mantra now is if you're going to use weapons in a war, then you have then use conventional weapons. Do not use chemical weapons on people. Yeah. And so it's, we're still putting up with that now. Then the kids are sent home from school. Then you can tell it's really serious. Yes. Is that the, the war is going to definitely happen now because the kids have been sent home. And then they, that's pretty much a pronouncement of doom. And the Federation tells the Alliance, pull back your troops or we'll attack Alliance positions. And now the two countries, the new, the two sides have bombers heading towards each other. Tamura can't believe what he's hearing. He just absolutely can't. It's yeah. un, it, again, it's just inconceivable to him. And His pandemonium ensues. In. Yeah. And 60s creators at Toho really knew how to do this right. With yes. The pandemonium. There are a lot of nice bunch of extras. And then we get the subplot with the girl getting left at the daycare and her mother not being able to make it back. Oh, so my get, heart. So we get that thrown <laughs> that, there, too. The worst part is the final dinner with the Tamura family. Oh, my oh, gosh. The, the entire dr- dramatic arc of the film builds to this moment sitting down. The last at the half hour of this movie is epic. It's, it is epic. It is emotionally brutal, but it's, oh, it is, it's majestically put together, but it will, it will rip your heart out. But the, the dinner scene in particular mm. is just, it's basically the dramatic explosion and then it's followed by the literal explosion, but they, they had to basically blow up, blow everything up twice. They had to blow the family up and then they had to <laughs> emotionally, and then they had to blow everything else up after that. But the tension of them sitting there and they didn't run they they decided to stay and no one smiling and you can you can tell that um tamura's optimism is just a facade now he's smiling for the sake of his family any hope that he has is like it's like at 0.01 percent now and it's just it's it's gone and the only thing that's left is him smiling because that's all he like. That's that's just what he wants to do. You know, he doesn't want to die sad, but he also doesn't want his family to know that they're going to die, even though they've accepted it more than he has. Yeah. And seeing him cry is tough. It is really, and especially and again, because he, he's he such a fun so guy. Effectively in this, he's his, so his emotions are great. And he, you know, it's, it's not hammed up. It's just no, right. It's not absolutely ounce, just yeah. where you want it. It's it's yeah. probably the most Ozu moment in the whole movie. I think so. Is, when he's out in the part. beautiful, the beautiful sunset, I think there's something about it being set during the the setting sun. It's it is very much like the sun's going down on him, everybody, everybody, the world. It's the last. You know, this could very well be the the last day for humanity, and it's it's dying. And you just like you can't stop the sun from disappearing behind the horizon. At this point, cooler heads will not prevail, and there will be, you can't stop what's about to happen. And the moment where you finally see what's left of this man just wither away and really die before the explosion can take him, and he cries about, "I will plant, see these tulips bloom." And uh, what a beautiful metaphor for for survival and wanting oh my to survive. gosh it's like the ending of gone with the wind it is the ending of actually very similar very very similar visually even uh-huh um, powerful i just powerful now thought moment. of that yeah yeah good thought <laughs> very good very appropriate it was very very similar and oh uh, it hurts <laughs> And the telegraphing scene between oh, Takano yes. and Psycho is like, wow, I, that's a good idea. That hurt, that one hurt that, be, because very good of the construction of the scene too. Yeah, yeah. I I have a fascination with uh, uh, st- r- stories about relationships, you know, especially love stories where there's some kind of uh, separation between the two characters. It can be like a physical separation, like say a Beauty and the Beast story, or it could be something where like they can only communicate to each other through Morse code. You can't see, they can't see each other's faces. They can't even hear each other's voices. The emotion and the important parts get through, but she's still not with him and he's still not with her. And I tell you what, they're, these two are a wonderful, you know, optimistic couple in the film. And um, again, if you tried to do it now, I feel in America, I feel like people would just be like, Oh, that's so cheesy. They're, you know, they're so in love. Yeah. And it it but it works so beautifully in this film. And uh, Yuriko Hoshi, she's one of my favorite Golden Age 
actresses. She she's you know she's magnificent in this film. And again, most people will know her for her her tokusatsu roles in kaiju films, Mothra vs. Godzilla, Ghidorah the Three Headed Monster, and uh, Megaguirus many years later. But she is she had a brilliant dramatic streak to her, and she could do a lot. And watching her face sending the message and the messages in that scene, like if 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 that didn't make you tear up, you know, like that's, that's just a powerful, powerful moment. And to do that and not make it hammy is harder than most people I, I think would, would assume because there's a a fine line between serious emotion and just like screaming into a camera. She sold it. uh, Frankie Sakai sold it. Takarada sells it that entire last moment with the family, she's saying goodbye to Takarada and then Frankie's final, final nail in the coffin, death of his optimism. It hurts just as much, if not more than finally seeing the explosions start. And it's about facial expressions and how you look more than it is about how you emote specifically. Yeah. Like it's a little bit more like a silent film sort of vibe that you want to do when you're trying to have that expression. Because if you, if you make it too expressive, if you sound like, if you turn into a method actor, then you, then your facial expressions just become grotesque and, and, and yeah. you've blown the moment, but this, they did it the right way this time. And I think it would be harder to pull this off now. Oh yeah. Like the moments like this in a, this in a theater classic. now. Yeah. And if you were to try to film something like this now, you'd hear laughing in the theater. I'd, be stunned like if if this film were to be shown like in like a retrospective screening or something here in america now which it really should be uh i'd i'd definitely buy tickets to go see this film in in theaters absolutely but during i'd love to see more of this movie i'd love to see this more exposed to uh americans absolutely but people i think people that didn't understand would laugh at some of the more dramatic moments now. And I've been at movies, older films, classic films from the film, the era this film was made and earlier with like heartbreaking, dramatic moments in them. And they might not even be like, you know, gone with the wind level drama or anything like that. Um, a few years ago, I, I went to go see Phantom of the Opera, the original 1925 silent version with Lon Chaney. Ooh, yeah, that's good. Um, it was, it was performed silently with a live um, organ accompaniment. And um, I've actually seen that twice now. Once when I was really young is the first time I saw the film. And then most recently, about a year ago, I went to go see it again. And I've seen that film God knows how many times. That's my favorite version of The Phantom. Even the moment, like Lon Chaney as The Phantom is so tragic in that role. He's this evil, you know, kind of mean, grotesque thing. But when his mask is taken off, you're first scared of him. And then if you you watch his face... Uh, as he realizes like what's happened she, that she he's been seen for what he truly is physically and his like Lon Chaney was a incredible actor with his face I mean he worked in silence right he had to be absolutely and I there were a couple of moments where he would like have his hand on his on his heart in a in a clenched fist over his heart and he would just look like he was just dying from sadness and um I I heard somebody snickering next to me and I, w- I just wanted to spin around and go, knock it off. <laughs> like, don't, like, come on, man. But th- I've had that happen on a couple of occasions with other films that I've gone to, older films, where a moment of serious drama, not hammy, not cheesy, like, somebody in there just didn't get it. And I think that's, like, sadly, that might happen. Like, if this film were to go back and it go into theaters here in the United States, in uh, preferably its Japanese original form, my, I, somebody would somebody would think that was funny, you know. God knows why, but like, somebody would think that was funny. I mean, th- this this movie ha- in general has very few moments of levity in it at all. You know, there there are some lighter moments in it, but there's no haha moment. Except you know maybe when he's in person, the, the the little impersonation that Yuriko Hoshi and Takarada do, like that's a funny moment. Like that made me smile. But everything else is basically there to keep you from just like descending into depression. Yes. The giving up entirely. You're like, I can't do this movie. The, the dramatic scenes at the very end with the actors, um, really putting a lot of emotion into their, their body language, their faces, their facial expressions and how they, they control them. 
is uh and they like, they're able to beautiful. express that disbelief too yes like God, like all these you have emotions. to express that sorrow but at the same time you have to express the the absolute uh, i can't believe this is happening kind yeah. of emotion yeah and you have to be able to balance those out and they they do a fantastic job at it and it's it, so again good. If, if they were overly emotive and, and panicky and everything it just wouldn't work and nope. and instead they go out to the tulips and it's like oh my god and and, yeah. and they haven't yeah. all grown up yet and psycho says the tulips will be able to grow even after everybody gets nuked and the, there are so many people that would probably be like this though oh i think so it would be so stunning you wouldn't panic you'd just be resigned yeah it's the yeah it's the two school of thoughts in the doomsday scenario one you run and you, i mean even if there's nowhere to run you run and then in in the other you just kind of sit at home and you put a good movie in pop some popcorn and wait for the bomb to drop on your house you know what mm-hmm. i mean and it's it's and then the the middle ground in there is the disbelief section because there's there's I have to survive. I have to run. There's, I can't believe this is happening and I'm frozen and I can't, and I'm just going to stay here. And then there's, yeah, I'm going to (laughs) die. Might as well Mm -hmm. uh, pop some popcorn. And I think what happens in this is kind of a mixture of those last two extremes. They don't run because they know fully well that, that, you know, where are they going to run? You know, where are they going to go? It's it's like submersion in Japan. Would I want to live in this world now? kind of thing too yeah exactly i think one thing that this movie doesn't do actually is that that other movies do uh like on the beach that that actually does deal with suicide i'm surprised there wasn't as much uh, that's a good point but it's there is there isn't anything about that in this movie but it's it's something that i think a lot of people would be contemplating oh i think so i if if, if they survive the first you know round of it Essentially, yeah, but exactly. Yeah, that's one thing that I found that that wasn't present, but the, just about everything else got covered. And we have our big finish, and our, our oh, missiles yes. are launched, and it's bye bye world. And the last 10 minutes of this is Tokusatsu extravaganza, and it's oh, like yeah. the end of Terminator 3. <laughs> <laughs> it basically Mach 16 is. missile headed straight for the heart of Tokyo, only two minutes. And then finally, war gets declared. You know, yeah, so if finally. you were waiting for war to be declared to do something, <laughs> then you got two minutes. Yeah. And, the, and the PM is alone, and he's uh, at the Conte, and he can't imagine, he can't believe it either. And and then after the, because they, they cut to the, the, sort of an unintentionally funny moment here, but they, they show the prime minister, and he's stoic. And then they show these stuffed animals, and then they show the girl. I think they probably should have showed the girl and then showed the stuffed animals. But I, I, I was sort of like, wait, is that the prime minister's stuffed animals? <laughs> <laughs> I need to have my teddy bear with me Did if he, I'm going to die. He, he, brought his, he brought him into the office to comfort, <laughs> comfort himself in his last moments. But then they show the girl and I was like, oh, the, uh, yeah. Oh, there you go, yeah. But then and, <laughs> they, showed, <laughs> they, they should have reversed the... The, the the two those two parts, but uh, but when you're when you're watching a movie like this, and when you're uh, surrounded in this atmosphere, you you sort of look for things to. You're desperate to find something that's <laughs> something. like you know, like oh, Prime Minister's teddy bear. Oh yeah, that's right. Everyone's <laughs> gonna die. But those those yeah. I have I know exactly what you mean. Mo- heavy films and heavy moments, in particular, like this one. Like the human brain just kind of naturally tries to find literally anything joyful to latch on to, even if yeah, it's, it's unintentional. Defense. That's entirely yeah. accurate. Yeah. And then it happens. We get our models yeah. and they're blown up instantly. And, and they were hung upside down and they were made out of wafers. And that's why so much of the stuff goes like straight up in the air when the explosion happens. But it also works really well because that's, what you'd expect it. It's not just a normal explosion. It's a nuclear explosion. You have to up the ante. You have to make it epic. It's amazing. And the tidal waves, even it really goes uh, a lot of places. And then it goes all out. The whole earth is changed and, and all this lava is flowing through uh, Tokyo and then the red sky and they show Mount Fuji several times. So sort of yeah. transitioning through these various stages of the nuclear bombing and, uh, the, and all, all the colors in the sky. 
the major cities are gone. There's radiation everywhere. And m a lot of stories like this, these disaster stories with the nuclear wars, a lot of the time it's the radiation is so bad that the earth is uninhabitable. That's how bad it is. And there are exceptions in the stories, but mostly it's radiation is everywhere. And in on the beach, for instance, that was the entire Northern hemisphere is so radiated that it, it it's impossible. It's completely uninhabitable. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Would, would the suicide be Takano and, uh, Ihara? Yes, absolutely. Maybe that's the suicide part. I so think it's that, like a, yeah, you know, it's not like a direct, I'm going to get a gun and blow my head off kind of thing. It's a sacrificial. It's, it's an acceptance. I would say it's an acceptance of the inevitable. And there's something very, very samurai. I think about it. Like there's yeah. a, they, they all have a, yeah, they that's all what I mean. find sacrificial. A, yeah. Yeah. They all find an honor in choosing death unanimously and no one blinks. Yeah. They all just go. So I would say it, it's not su like suicide. And I guess what you would say is like a, a traditional kind of way we would think about this, this act. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's not definitely, the way you would think about doing it, but yeah. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. Because when I, when I saw, when I've seen this film, God knows how many times. And, uh, you know, I, when I watch that scene, I don't like the first word that doesn't, that pops into my head isn't isn't suicide it's uh mm -mm. i think i think of um i think of sacrifice and i think of uh honor and i think of uh loneliness <laughs> I, I think i think of th they could be the last boat on the ocean you know everywhere else is blown up and yet they choose to go home and it is an act of of suicide but it doesn't come across as a sell a selfish act of suicide because there's a you know in samurai culture suicide was not a selfish way to go necessarily depending on the circumstances right. but so i think when and from western perspective we tend to see taking your own life as a a selfish act and it's not so much so you know when we're talking about the bushido code something that's outside of you know an american wheelhouse and something that's more japanese centric so it, it that is so i would say that's definitely this film's way of dealing with dealing with the idea of suicide and i mean if the film wasn't japanese enough you know it wasn't mm -hmm. didn't have a super duper japanese perspective that moment is it, and it doesn't come before the tragedy it comes after the tragedy which is also interesting so yeah i would say that's mm -hmm. definitely this film's take on suicide yeah when we go back to the rubble of Tokyo, the first thing that I asked myself when watching the movie for the first time was, okay, where's the diet building? And then the, mm -hmm. there it was, like five seconds later. Yep. Totally called it. And then we get the, the text, this story is only fiction, but it could be a reality tomorrow. Or, or 1962, which is next year. Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which yeah. is one of the closest calls, happens uh, one year later. Uh, That's this amazing. Movie was released, so uh, when it said it could be a reality tomorrow, it was, they were meant darn to, close. Met it dead seriously and uh, yeah, got it. Yeah, got, got yeah. it really accurate. We must join together, hand in hand, so that this will never come to pass. That's our theme with an exclamation point delivered in a an over an overnight UPS package. That's right. <laughs> All tied up with a with a bow on top for us. Yes, an, an apocalyptic bow. That concludes part two, and now I will move on to the related topic. You're listening to KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. In part three of the podcast, I will be analyzing a topic that was either brought up in the film or was going on at the time of the film's release. And the topic for this episode is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Well, here's why I chose this topic. The, the Cold War is a huge deal in this movie, and NATO is represented by the Federation, while the Warsaw Pact is represented by the Alliance. Japan has a role in this topic, though, as I will show. I went to a conference in Istanbul in 2002, and it was for the Atlantic Treaty Association. It was only a month before uh, Erdogan was elected for the first time in Turkey. I learned a great deal of information about NATO that year, and it helped me to understand more about the security environment around the world. 
NATO is a political and military organization created by the Washington Treaty in 1949. It is a military alliance dedicated to peace and stability in Europe. It provides for collective defense and shared security. Europe and North America are bound in this transatlantic alliance. Its main purpose was to protect Western Europe from the threat of Soviet invasion and or attack. With the deterioration of the nation-state system and the emergence of non-state entities threatening security, NATO also focuses on those security issues as well. Most of American and Allied armies were disbanded after World War II, so Western Europe was vulnerable to the very large army that the Soviets possessed. In 1961, the year that this film was released, the NATO membership consisted of the United States, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, United Kingdom, Greece, Turkey, and West Germany. In 1961, the Warsaw Pact membership consisted of the Soviet Union, Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, and Romania. NATO's goals were to deter Soviet expansionism, forbid the revival of a nationalist militarism in Europe, and to encourage European political integration. In 1949, NATO was created by the signing of the Washington Treaty in Washington, D.C. In 1950, the military began to integrate and weapons purchases began to take place. By 1955, West Germany had joined NATO. Germany was rearmed, and that was only 10 years after the end of World War II. And the difference between the Warsaw Pact and NATO are quite easy, actually, uh, even though it implies that these two organizations are somewhat equal on face value, which they are not. In the Warsaw Pact, troops were used to suppress popular uprisings and enforce Russian rule. Also, the Warsaw Pact was formed as a reaction to NATO more than its own uh, single entity uh, on its own. Also, there were lots of opposition to the Warsaw Pact in member states of the Warsaw Pact, and they didn't join of their own volition sometimes. There was also the fact that Eastern Europe was essentially a buffer zone that the Soviet Union wanted between the Soviet Union and the West. And that's really all that mattered. It was not exactly the same. In NATO, an armed attack against one or more NATO countries is considered an attack against all. Because of the nukes, the Western European countries didn't need to have large standing armies because there was no need. Instead, they could focus on economic growth. European countries wanted NATO protection. There was not much needed to sell them on the idea of NATO. They say, okay, mutual defense treaty? Sure, where do we sign? Let's buy some weapons and point them at the communists, shall we? Initially, the whole idea with NATO was to keep the Americans in, keep the Soviets out, and keep the Germans down. The reason why uh, these missiles and everything was being pointed at the Soviet Union to begin with was because the Soviet Union had a very large invasion force all ready to go to sweep into Western Europe whenever, basically, we thought that they wanted to. Here's a bit more background on the motivations behind creating NATO. The Berlin blockade was one of the very first crises in the Cold War. When the Allies introduced the new Deutschmark currency for West Germany and in West Berlin, the Soviets blockaded West Berlin, demanding that the currency be removed from West Berlin. The Soviets wanted Germany to remain economically weak, so they wanted a devalued currency in Germany that they themselves issued. The Allies already moved 250 million Deutschmarks to Berlin, and it became Berlin's default currency in the Soviet area of Berlin as well. So because of the new currency and the Marshall Plan money, the German economy would experience a revival. This scared the Soviets, so they demanded that the currency not be allowed in Berlin, hence the blockade. The Soviets cut off transportation and even electricity and water and food and energy, and it became these back-and-forth reactions between the Allies and the Soviets. The Allies cut off steel and coal to East Germany, which had major repercussions economically for many years. Air turned out to be the only way left to get to West Berlin, hence the Berlin Airlift. 
So the Berlin airlift was pretty much food, most of it. And it was two million Berliners, and they were going to be starved to death by the Soviets unless something was done. Some candy was even dropped off to children, too, which was a great propaganda tool. The airlift was sustained long enough for the Soviets to give up the blockade. This event proved that the Allies couldn't just sit around and wait for what the Soviets do next. Czechoslovakia in 1948 had been taken by communists as well, and they had overthrown the lawful government that was there. In Germany, the 1990s and the early 2000s were a huge transition period for Germany because Germany was reunified in the late 80s when the Berlin Wall came down, and I happened to be in Germany in 1998, which was a major year of transition for Germany. When I went to Berlin, the skyline was mostly construction cranes. The Potsdamer Platz was being redone from the ground up. The new chancellor's residence was being constructed. The Reichstag was in the middle of a makeover. They were busy integrating the two subway systems of East and West Berlin, because, of course, all this stuff was separate. I also visited Checkpoint Charlie, which was uh, so much in, uh, in history regarding the Berlin Wall. It was a, a major point in between East and West Berlin. I also visited Bonn, which was the former capital of the Federal Republic of Germany, which was West Germany. The Bundestag was, of course, in the process of moving from Bonn to Berlin. While I was in Berlin, I also visited the Berlin Airlift Museum, which uh, that 1998 was the 50th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift from 1948, which was the Allied response to the Berlin blockade. So I got to see uh, examples of the kind of uh, packages that they dropped off with the uh, staple foods in them. And this is like milk for children, just really obvious, important, basic stuff because they literally were not allowed to have food. So this was how important NATO was to people. NATO meant security, and now it still does mean security. Especially after the Berlin Airlift, NATO was looked at as very necessary. The Soviets had a much bigger army in this period, and they could have invaded Western Europe. Nuclear deterrence was a big part of NATO's plans in Western Europe. So if the Soviets start invading Western Europe then NATO bombs the Soviets into oblivion. The building of the Berlin Wall solidified the two-sided situation in Europe, and that was done in the year 1961, the same year that this movie was released. Of all the events working up to the biggest flashpoint in the Cold War, it was definitely the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. This was when the Soviets attempted to set up nuclear missiles in Cuba that could reach most of the United States. European countries with NATO forces in them, particularly the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, they are glad that NATO is there, and that Eastern Europe also especially associates NATO with increased security and protection. NATO does have a missile defense system, and it's entirely defensive in nature. In the 1950s, the Warsaw Pact had a defensive position against invasion. And since it turned out that Western Europe didn't have much of an invasion force, then the Warsaw Pact kind of changed things in the 60s. And this movie takes place after that change in tactics took place. So then the Warsaw Pact started concentrating on nuclear weapons and a ground invasion of Western Europe. So the NATO plan as a response to this was to use nuclear weapons massively at the outset defensively. Now, this is what was called massive retaliation. So the Warsaw Pact, they had a 5 to 1 or 6 to 1 troop advantage over NATO in Europe. And then what the plan was, was that the Warsaw Pact would invade West German cities and Northwest European cities. And first they would hit them with nukes destroy the cities, and then they would have the troops come in to actually technically claim the land and the country, so to speak. So these cities included Vienna, even though Vienna wasn't part of NATO, as well as Copenhagen, Brussels, and a few Italian cities as well. And so you'd be nuking the crap out of them and then moving all these tanks and troops in there. The NATO plan 
was to have about 1,000 plus targets to be hit with nuclear bombs in the, in the Soviet Union, in the People's Republic of China, and other countries that were allied with the Soviet Union. It would be just nukes, massive retaliation, just the United Kingdom alone at this time had 40 nukes that they planned to hit the Soviet Union with. But the cities and territory that the USSR would have been invading would have been a radioactive wasteland. Like, I don't see the point here. Because you're going to put the troops and the tanks in there and everything, and then the troops are going to get radiated. So, it, it's just odd. Uh, but this was what the plan NATO had was in order to counter this plan that the Soviets had, which it was clear that they did have this plan because this invasion force is just sitting around there. And uh, it's, it's really what, what the dynamic was in Europe at the time. One thing that is not really mentioned in this movie is how Japan is. It says that they're part of the Federation, which is the NATO equivalent here in this movie. But the, Japan really doesn't take into account in this movie much about the fact that they're being under, that they're really under an umbrella of protection as well as being open because you you do it can work both ways like that and this was one reason why Japan didn't end up becoming a major battlefield during the Cold War there are two possible situations that Japan could have gone through at the end of World War II one was Japan could have waited to surrender to the US longer than they did and a Cold War standoff would have occurred, because the Soviets would have invaded Hokkaido, possibly even northern Honshu, and then and then we would have this alternate communist Japan, and it would become its own Japanese Soviet Socialist Republic, and eventually a base for an invasion force would occur in there. All the troops would be moved in there, and they would be parked right north of Tokyo. The United States allies with South Japan, and then you get a possible stalemate like in Germany. The other situation that could have happened was Japan might not have allied with anyone until it's too late, and then a hot war erupts. And so the U.S. would be in the south of Japan, and the Soviets would be in the north of Japan, and then it would be like Japan would be turned into Korea. There would be a north side, a south side, and Japan would be the battleground. Possibly millions of people would have been caught in the crossfire. Japan's economy would have been destroyed. It could have been, it could have been turned into a wasteland if they had gone with tactical nuclear warheads and stuff like they have done in this movie. Japan could have ended up like Germany in a better case scenario, or like Korea or Vietnam in a worst case scenario. Japan narrowly avoided these two other fates. Some of the nations that have suffered from the Cold War include Korea, Vietnam, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, much of the rest of Eastern Europe, Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq, and Cambodia, and many more. Instead, Japan was changed into an unsinkable aircraft carrier off the East Coast. The long-term strategy for Japan was to have the economy really strong and be a good source of capital for development of other countries in Southeast and East Asia and for Japan to contribute to security in the region. And then Japan gets a lot of money through the economic awakening and renewal, and then they get to spread the money around enough in order to make sure that people do not get too angry. Japan really had its own special alliance with the U.S. during this time that this movie was made, and it still does. And that made it a bigger deal than a lot of European countries' alliances were in NATO. And it has kept Japan safe so far in many respects. NATO cooperates with Japan in a number of different ways, and the ties between Japan and NATO have been getting a lot closer. Japan partners with NATO in issues like disaster relief and humanitarian assistance, maritime security, cyber defense, non-proliferation, peace and security, and defense science and technology. And Japan provides assistance for operations in Afghanistan, and in the 1990s, they supported things in the Balkans. And this integration with NATO and Japan has been happening since the early 1990s. Japan and NATO have never been as close as they are now. 
And so it's, it's been happening for a while. It took 30 years after this movie, but Japan did end up partnering with NATO itself. Japan and NATO are naturally compatible because of the system of shared values, democracy, rule of law, and proactive contribution to security and peace. So how has this issue changed over time? Well, over time, Japan's grown so much closer to NATO and the United States, so if a movie like The Last War was made again, it might be more similar to Shin Godzilla, where China and Russia do Japan no favors, while Japan works with mostly Americans and Europeans. This movie is a big message of peace to the rest of the world, and Japan was a huge player in World War II, and this movie shows that they are continuing the uh, turnaround from that experience. The movie definitely expresses the way that the Japanese view the issue of the Cold War at the time that the movie was made, and the anti-nuclear sentiment is of course a big huge deal. So that's what this movie is saying about the Japanese national spirit. They want peace, they don't want to be caught in the middle of things, and they don't want to become a wasteland battleground place for proxy wars between uh, two global hegemonic powers. Of course, in the 1984 Godzilla film, The Return of Godzilla, uh, th this is revisited again, a lot of these themes, because the Cold War was kind of almost uh, at a very big crisis point again in 1983, around then, because uh, we had a new president who kind of didn't know what was going on until he saw a movie about nuclear war happening, and then things really changed then, and he got the understanding of it. And uh, Reagan at times, what happened was he, he didn't go to these tactical kind of meetings about these issues, and then once he did, he realized what was going on, and he became a major opponent of nuclear war, and uh, he wanted to get a lot of things drawn down in the Cold War. The Japanese economy in 1961 grew 12.04%, which is really huge, and it is a big indicator of the Japanese economic miracle taking place. In order to learn more about the Japanese economic miracle, you can check the episode on Kaiju Vision Radio that has to do with King Kong vs. Godzilla from 1962. Thank you again, Daniel, for coming on the show. Daniel is with the Godzilla Novelization Project, and you can visit his website at godzillanovelizationproject.wordpress.com. And it, you read all of his amazing work that he's done on this project so far. I have been, and it's fantastic. And uh, novelizing all these Japanese Godzilla movies is really such a cool project. And, and uh, as I've said on the show a number of times, uh, everybody, uh, check it out. It's really awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate that. This episode is dedicated to Yuriko Hoshi, a wonderful Japanese actress. She is. She was in this movie today that we covered, as well as Mothra vs. Godzilla, the first Ghidorah movie, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, and she also appeared in Godzilla vs. Megaguirus from 2000, which everybody at G-Fest, when we saw that uh, screened at the movie theater, everybody applauded when she first appeared on the screen because everybody in the kaiju fandom knows her quite well. And she's a fantastic actress, really great. And I think my favorite with her still is um, probably the first Ghidorah movie. I just, she's just yeah. fantastic in that. She's absolutely fantastic in that. I um I echo your sentiments. Uh, Yuriko Hoshi was an indelible part of my childhood because the first Godzilla film I ever saw from beginning to end was Mothra versus Godzilla as Godzilla versus the thing. I remember the first time I saw her in that film and I, I all of the films since that I've seen her in and I've come to appreciate how remarkable an actress she was, especially from films like the last war. She did a lot more than, you know, just her, her few Kaiju appearances, but um, for her work with these films and for being, you know, a, a face from my childhood and, uh, for all of her talent and all of her, her beauty and just being 
a really, really important part of why I love a lot of these movies so much. I, uh, I send her my thanks wherever she is. And, uh, she, she did pass away several months ago and I never got the chance to meet her, which was really, really unfortunate, but, um, neither did I. Yeah. Her work lives on, um, her beautiful smile lives on. She's, um, she's, I hope she's out there somewhere right now and knows that she's still loved and appreciated and that her work is still so beloved by people all around the world. So thank you, Miss Hoshi. This one's for you. The next episode of this show will be 1962's Gorath, which is another disaster movie uh, that has a kaiju in the Japanese version, at least. And it involves the titular star that is on the path towards our solar system. The American movie that would be the companion to that is called When Worlds Collide, if you've ever seen that. It's a really fun movie. I really love it a lot. I've uh, seen it many, many times now, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. I'd like to send a shout out to Sean Stiff, who is our patron. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. He donated at the Kaiju Visionary level. Donating is worth it. You'll get the inside track to what's going on in this show. You'll get to message me personally. If you'd like to send some feedback, I'd love to hear from you. The email address is feedback at kaijuvision.com. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Kaiju Vision Radio is available on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, Podcast Addict, YouTube with scenic videos, and on kaijuvision.com. If you like the podcast, please donate on Patreon. I'm Brian Scherschel. I'm Daniel DeManna. And this is KVR Kaiju Vision Radio. See you next time.